Sometimes it helps when you turn it off. Good morning, everyone. Well, welcome to the Young Men's Bible class on this beautiful Sunday morning. Let's start off with hymn number 235. Number 235. God of grace and God of glory. several of the evangelists in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and became a very popular hymn nationwide. And it's also in the, in the folks very, as, as a, one of the last ones that was added. Pass Me Not, hymn number 149. <laughs> Actually mentioned in the text. 
If I have my information correct, Sandy Rabbit will be back with us starting next week. Delighted to hear her come back with us. And of course, this morning, we're delighted to have Don Listen with us. We're really excited to have him. Tell us a little bit about the step of Franksboro, a, pro a, a program that actually had its origins here at First Presbyterian Church not too many years ago. So we're very proud of what that program has become. We're also proud to have Nancy Fogarty with us this morning. We've had uh, uh, the, the, the good fortune of having some wonderful pianists at this church who are so willing to come out of their own Sunday school classes to come here and play for us. And so we're grateful. Thank you, Nancy, for being here. I was told by someone here that we have a, a wonderful sermon to look forward to this morning. I haven't heard it yet because I didn't go to first service, I'll go to second. But uh, apparently, Jill's going to talk. The sermon talk, talk, type, topic or title is Philadelphia. And it talks about, she's going to be talking about some of her personal experiences. There's something looking forward to hearing that. For our prayer hymn this morning, this is something a little unusual. We don't normally sing this hymn that often here because it's usually a hymn that you use at the end of a service or at the end of a, at the end of an evening. This is hymn number 205, Abide With Me. But it's not necessarily an ending song. It's often sung as a prayer of praise to God to remain present with us through all of our life, through the trials and through the triumphs and even through death. So a beautiful hymn to include. And even though we don't sing it often, I know all of you know this. Hymn number two of them. Maybe I should get it out. Um, 
we welcome all the visitors here and guests, and certainly members of the young men's Bible class. <laughs> this is the time for a health and welfare uh, report. Is anybody <laughs> on the floor have uh, any comments about anybody? We miss Russell. Russell always gave us a report. Uh, uh, announcements I have. Uh, I, uh, I want John Sullivan to come up and tell you about uh, packing up meals. I'll just stand here. Okay. All right. <laughs> what I want to do is get a report on Neil Bill yesterday morning at the church. And to let you know that we have a very good representation from our Sunday school. And I also want you to know that it's okay to bring your walker. There, there are jobs to be done sitting down at another table. And so hopefully we'll do this again. It's a church wide event. And one of the things that I admire about this program is it's very well organized. And you have people like the preacher's uh, husband doing the heavy lifting. So if you don't want to do heavy lifting, he or somebody else will do it. But it's a great opportunity to provide fresh food for people in our community that are hungry. And it's a great um, thing that we're doing to honor Neil Donovan. A priest went to a yard sale and he bought an old lawnmower. Uh, the owner <clears throat> assumed that he would know how to start it and use it and so forth. But when he got home, he pulled on the road several times and nothing happened. Uh, this sort of annoyed him, so he went back to the yard sale and spoke with the previous owner. And he said, I pulled on your uh, lawnmower I bought several times, but I can't get it to start. And the previous owner said, well, you uh, have to curse it a little too when you're trying to start it. And he said, but I'm a man of the cloth, the priest did. He said, I don't even remember how to curse. He said, you pull on the rope a few times and it'll come back to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, our speaker, as uh, Lane has already said, is John Wisman. I tried to make a list of the things that uh, he was part of, and uh, I didn't have time on the program to list all those, or at least I wouldn't have given him time for the program. Uh, I do have that um, his director of development has uh, stepped up Greensboro. And his bio includes the uh, latest, his bio, which is in the latest uh, YMC newsletter, uh, tells about an additional eight church activities and seven community involvements. There may be many more. But John, come on up and skip this. Well, good morning, everybody. Do y'all need me to use the microphone or can y'all hear me? Okay, good. Um, yeah, I'm deeply involved in this church. I'll tell you how I got here. I was living in Kernersville and going to Main Street United Methodist Church. And about six weeks in, I went to that church and nobody knew my name. But I knew Dolly Jennings in this church, and she had invited me to do some, several things. Remember back in the day when the Fellowship Hall was under the sanctuary, and we'd have those Wednesday night dinners. Y'all remember that? Those sellers taught me how to paint a chair because I came to those classes. And then I got involved with a hair group in this church, and I came one Sunday morning, and I parked behind Fisher's, and from the time I got from Fisher's into the sanctuary, at least 20 people in this church addressed me by name. And I sat in that sanctuary, and I thought, I think this is where God wants me to be. So I've been here now almost 30 years, and I'm grateful to be here. And I've worked with wonderful people like Clint Williamson, serving communion, washing those communion trays every Sunday, and with many of you others. John Sullivan's a great friend. 
So Jim, I see you back there. Thank you all for letting me come and speak to you today. My new passion is Step Up Greensboro. And you all probably know a little bit about Step Up Greensboro. And you're going to see why as I go through this presentation. Here's one of our graduating classes. And you might recognize that house. It's the house across the street on Green. That's our old Paisley house. We're not there anymore. We are here in the church, actually, just right next door in the old first school area. Um, and we love that new, we love our new dig. <coughs> we appreciate the church for allowing us to be there. This is one of our classes. We do classes every month. And we have about 10, we love it if we have 10 people, but it's 8 to 10 to 15 people per class. So what we want to do, or what we strive to do, is to motivate, empower, and equip people to become self-sufficient and stable through life skills and employment training. That's what we do. We are an employment training program in Greenville. So our community impact since 2011, since we started, I'm going to highlight the two things. We've trained over 1,400 people, and 57% of those people have gained employment. And that employment currently is paying an average of about $14 an hour. So of all those people around, what, six or 700 folks earning $14 an hour, we are a step up, not a hand out to folks. You'll notice there <coughs> some other statistics <coughs> excuse me, about us. Um, the most important thing I think is I'd like to point out that we have about 25 local businesses that partner with us and are willing to help us employ individuals that come through our program. Y'all might recognize that young lady there. She's the one who got this whole ball rolling. She um, had observed this program in Raleigh and thought that it might have an impact in Greensboro. And so she approached the church. I was, at the time, the co-chair of the outreach committee here. Um, I've been involved with a lot of stuff here at this church. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and March Michael was the chair of outreach. Y'all may remember her. And Sharon came and said, I've got an idea for the church, something that we need to do. She had already been doing um, Hot Dish and Hope. And when she told me about Step Up, when we called, I think, Rise Up in Raleigh, I said, Sharon, that sounds like a fantastic idea. I was like, I think it's absolutely something that Greensboro would want to be involved in and something that this church could get behind. I said, but I, you know, I said, I'm also on the finance committee and we don't have any money for that. <laughs> and we don't have any manpower. She said, oh, well, I want the outreach committee to take this on the project. And I said, well, I said, Sharon, I said, we I just don't think that's going to happen. And I said, this will need a CEO. Hey, John, yeah. can you speak up a little bit? Oh, I'm sorry. I said, this will need a CEO. Yeah. 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 Okay. I said, this will need a CEO. I said, we, I said, if something like this is going to start, you're going to have to make it happen. You're going to have to be the CEO of this. And so she did, as you all know now, since it's been in existence for over 10 years. So she stepped up to the plate and she made it happen. And she found funding for it and all kinds of great things. So, so here's where we see our funding. And I'm going to give y'all an idea of exactly how much that is. Let me do part of my notes here, which is one of the You would have thought I had not practiced this, and I have. I'm sorry for this. So let's go back to our funding. You see that our we have basically four categories for funding, and I will share with you what that funding is. For individuals, since 2014, we have received over $332,000 in individual donations from our faith communities. We have received almost $100,000 of contributions. From our corporations and businesses in the area, we have received almost 
thousand dollars in funding since 2014. And from our foundations, and those are local foundations like the Ryan Foundation or SEMA Love Foundation, and you all are familiar with these, we have received $270,000 worth of funding. So since 2014, when we've been keeping records of this, we have received almost $800,000 in funding. And basically what that funding pays for are the individuals that do our work. We are the type of organization that we don't have a lot of physical costs. We have a small amount of rent that we pay to the church, and of course, our utilities. But basically, it's the supplies for the program that we use, our folders, paperwork, and copies, and things like that. But basically, our program is our people. And without the people, there is not a program. So. What that funding is supporting is it is supporting the salaries of the people that are actually issuing the training. We are fairly lean. We only have eight staff members, which is, I think, really great. Um, these are the people that we serve. Most of our individuals are individuals who have great barriers to overcome. They are homeless or the majority of, of them, many of them, at least 50% of them, have some type of criminal background, um, which means they had a run in with the law because they had some drugs on them or whatever. In North Carolina, if you have certain substances on you, it is a felony offense. So many of them have a felony on their background. What we do is help them deal with that and help them present themselves in a positive light despite that. Um, like I said, many of them are homeless. In North Carolina, or actually in this area, if you do not have your name on either a mortgage or a rental application for an apartment, despite the fact that you might be living with someone, you are considered homeless. So if you are living with a cousin or your parents or somebody else and your name is not on that lease agreement or on that mortgage you are technically considered homeless you don't have to be living in a tent city or on the street somewhere so that was a statistic that i was not aware of so until i joined this program um many of the individuals that we have have of course as you might imagine um lack education or skills so one of the things that we encourage to help them do is to obtain their GED if they haven't graduated from high school. Or if they have graduated from high school and are interested in pursuing additional educational opportunities, we have a partnership with um, GTCC where they can begin to take classes. Many of those classes are free, um, and they have classes over at GTCC in all different types of skill sets, hospitality, welding, HVAC, all kinds of different things. And so, of course, our program is focused on getting individuals involved in these classes so that they can have stable, meaningful employment, not just a job. We're, we're not, I mean, any one of them could go out tomorrow and get a job at McDonald's or Hardee's or somewhere like that doing food service. That's just a job. We're more focused on helping them find real stable employment that might lead to some type of a career path. So that's what we do. So, how do we get people? Um, word of mouth, things like me coming here and speaking with you all today, so that you, if you encounter someone who might need our program, you can refer them. I put brochures and newsletters and stuff about our different um, classes back there on the back table. Please feel free to take any of those when you leave here. Um, and then, of course, we have media outlets. Like everybody else, we're trying to be media savvy. So we have things on the internet and Facebook and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but we also have a partnership with the Salvation Army and with um, Urban Ministry. And of course, you know, the Salvation Army and Urban Ministry both have shelters, and folks coming through their shelters are also referred to our program. And we readily accept that, and it is a partnership where they pay us to do the training, so that is a source of income for us as well. 
and that grant for both Salvation Army and United um, Federal for Urban Ministry is a United Way grant. So if you all are supporting the United Way, ultimately in a way you're supporting us, and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. So what are our requirements? You have to be an adult, obviously, 18 to 60. We had a, actually a 64-year-old in our last class. You must have a valid ID and a social security number. So we want to make sure that we know who you are. We ask that you be substance free and have no pending charges. Um, we do a background check on all of our individuals so that we know exactly who is in our classes and exactly what we're dealing with. We do not take anyone who is a sex offender. And if you have pending charges, you have to resolve that issue before you can actually take our class. And of course, the most important thing is you must be present for our job training week, Monday through Friday, from 8.30 to 4. We usually finish before 4, but we insist that everyone who's taking the class treat this like a job, because it is their job. Their job is to find a job. So that leads us to our primary program, which is our jobs readiness program. It is a week long training in which you learn all kinds of different things. Resume building, um, communication skills, you all can read, I don't have to read that for you. But one important aspect of that program is the accountability piece that we hold everyone who has participated in. We just had a class that graduated a week ago. We started out with nine people and we finished with nine people. And we were very happy about that. Um, we do things in that class like helping them dress for success. And part of the dressing for success is not just telling them what they should look like when they go to an interview, but we actually have a clothing closet over in the old Shepherd building. And it's set up like a sword. And we have volunteers who come in and work with these individuals on the second day of training after they have been assessed. That there is an assessment period in which the individuals on staff and volunteers review the individuals from the standpoint of are they ready? What is their housing situation? Do they have transportation? I mean, it is a, a rigorous assessment. And then they get to go to the clothing closet. And it's almost like a shopping experience for them. It's the same experience that all of us have when we go to the hub, to the zoo, or whatever. You have someone who helps you pick out your outfit. And we have some really nice clothing over there. And so each one of these individuals, both male and female, will come away from that experience with an outfit that is job interview appropriate. And for many of them, it's the first time they've ever had it. And I will tell you from being a part of that, watching the transformation that happens with these individuals when they see themselves in a proper suit of clothing is incredible. That's when in the program, you begin to see them realize for themselves that they could be something different than what they had been. And so that's a really great moment in that process. So we also teach them things about how to build their confidence, how to talk about themselves in a way that is appropriate to an interview. You know, I think it's been a long time since I've done an interview, but one of the questions that most people get asked is, well, tell me a little bit about yourself. And I think each one of us can answer that question quite easily. Right? I like to golf, I'm interested in, you know, love the beach, blah, blah, blah. I mean, but for any of these folks who have never had a voice, that's a very difficult question to answer. And so what we do is we give them the skill set to help them answer that question, to be able to say, I really, I, I, I'm very creative. Um, we had this one young woman in the class, Carlotta, and she almost was paralyzed when she was asked the question. She could barely see. And one of the interviewers, that we do some mock interviewing, some practice interviewing, one of the interviewers said to her, what do you think somebody would say about you? And immediately she said, I'm smart. And I was part of that practice interview and I jumped right in and I said, yes, Carla, you are smart. Be confident about that. Be bold about that. Tell people that you're 
you're smart. And she said, and you know, I really like math. And I said, you like math? I was like, nobody likes math. I was like, are you kidding me? I was like, you need to tell people that. I said, it's the job that you're practice interviewing for is for a cashier's position. I said, that was huge strength. Tell someone in the interview that you are really good at math. I said, because you're trying to be a cashier for them. I said, that will be a huge strength for you. But what I found in the work that we've been doing is that it's difficult sometimes for these individuals to make those connections. And so that's one of the things that we help them to. I only have 18 slides. Um, it's not going to be a long, it's not going to be a board and long presentation. And the last one is a great little bit. So we do have other programs that extend beyond our jobs training week. We have a money boot camp, which is a seven-week program that is specifically related just to finances. It meets once a week. And um, individuals that participate, that's open to anybody in the community. You don't have to go on through our training, our jobs training program. For our interview basics, <clears throat> that's just the lab that we have going on it, it, in our offices. People can drop in on Tuesdays and Thursdays and hone up on their computer skills. The character development classes, both of those classes do require that you have done our jobs training first. And the character development classes are an ongoing weekly opportunity for individuals who have done the jobs training to meet with each other and just sort of build on those skills, have an opportunity to mentor each other, support each other. If they have a, you know, topics from time to time, and they have a guest speaker. It's an hour long meeting at some point during the week, and we have that both for the men's and women's group. For the, the, the women's group, it's a, as you might imagine, an intensely personal thing. Those women have been involved with this for over five years now. Many of them have been coming back repeatedly, and it is a safe place for them. Most of our big meetings happen in this room, and we're grateful to the church for that. Um, we've created a safe space for folks, and so we're very happy about all of that. And then finally, we have a, a class called Life Skills. Life Skills is a 36-week program. They meet once a week, and it's broken down into four different areas. Uh, one of them is finances, another one of them is you know, like personal interpersonal skills development, those types of things. And it's an incentivized program. So as they complete each part of that program, they will receive an incentive, a gift card, or something, um, we provide them with it. It meets in the evenings, and we provide them with a meal. It is a family centric type of thing, and so if they have children, children can come. What we try to instill in that life skills program is that it's not just about you, but it's about everyone around you, it's your entire family. If you don't have money for new tennis shoes for a kid. It's not because you're denying that child that, it's just that it's not a part of my budget. So it's it's a, a holistic approach. These are some of the things that happen in character development. And these are the different four different areas that we talk about in the life skills program. And with the life skills program, there's a graduation at the end, just like a real graduation, cap and gown and a diploma and all of that kind of stuff. Um, we really make it something that you can celebrate. For many of our individuals, as you might imagine, if they've had a past experience with our criminal justice system, they will have big gaps in their resume where they may have graduated from high school, had a run-in with the law, maybe gone to prison or been incarcerated for a while. Now they're trying to re-enter the workforce. Explaining that on your, in your interview or on an application can sometimes be very difficult. So what Step Up gives them is an opportunity to put something fresh and new on their resume. Completed Step Up Greensboro Jobs Readiness Training 2022. And it allows them to speak about their past in a way that is positive and not negative. One of the things that we encourage them to do is to turn their negative into a positive. To say to someone, I made some mistakes in my past, Thank you for the opportunity to explain that to you. 
I have just recently completed a job readiness program, and I am a new person and ready to do my life goal. That's how we help them with deal with some of those things that happen. And the employment partners that we have know that many of the folks that are coming to them may have had a past that they are trying to overcome and they're willing to work with those folks. So I'm going to hopefully launch this video. Leroy Farmer was one of our participants, and he has a very powerful story, and I hope that you can make this work. So let's see what happens. Isn't technology a wonderful thing? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> something on the computer besides well I don't I, you know I don't know in class we just touched it and it somehow Freedom is everything, man. There's nothing like freedom. Being behind a bar, you feel like you're dead. The cage, and I couldn't read when I first came to the post. Couldn't read when I was three times. Can't read the kids' letters. Can't read the text. You can't even write a letter back. But like a fool. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go on this. I'm going to go to class. I wanted to fall in love with her. I saw her fall in love with Matt. I never stopped. When I got out of the city, I was three and one of the entire seven months old. Was not able to buy for my family. A guy who was 40 years old, no real job. Now, everything I've done is old, 10 years old. Here I go. How can I have to explain myself to an employer that I did 10 years in prison, I'm 40 years old, trying to start my life home? So I learned about a program called Step Up Green Club, the job training program. So I said, why not? I'm going to give it a shot. My first day at Step Up, I was nervous, not knowing what to expect. I'm thinking I was just going to be able to read through the program, not knowing that you just can't read through the program. It ain't that easy. They open you up stuff that you're very uncomfortable about, stuff that you'll never want to. That's how I'm going to find myself a part of the I mean, they got a panel of three that will hit you with so many different, different interview questions that it sharpens you up. I've never been in an interview that hard before. I've been in a lot of interviews after that. None was hard to want to step up with stuff. It showed me how to put things in order and how to say certain things during the interview. Help your application. It will help you with your resume. A lot of people will stop writing the lesson. Help you learn how to do contacts or job contacts. What about this? That's one. I like that. They got the new suits. And they teach you every little thing you need to know as far as the way you should dress to our interview. Our suit. Every bit of my own suit before. Person? Yeah. Oh, that again? That's all the suit of my life. I took a picture to show my mom. And I said, well, I would look like in a suit. I swear, my mom cried. She couldn't believe me. She had to see how boy in a suit, his first suit. When I'm wearing a suit, I feel successful. I feel great. I feel amazing. I'm like a new man. I can conquer the world. Yeah. I know a woman. My aunt is amazing. That's my mentor. Like, I have a father and a man. I can go to with any question. Anything that's on my mind won't judge me, no matter how bad you have or 
what you've done in life. Talk to someone like him, they can feel like you can do anything. Anybody that's struggling to get ahead and need help and need some guidance, step up and say it for them. Like family, a second chance, better way of life. Two years later, he is still alive. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, let's see if this other one's working. They should never put. Um, Someone is always in charge of technology. <laughs> but anyway, yes, Leroy is still thriving. As a matter of fact, we have our um, annual fundraising event, which is coming up next Tuesday, um, October the 4th, here at the church, um, which I think is very appropriate since we started out as an offshoot ministry at First Presbyterian Church, will be in the Mullet Life Center. And Leroy is actually going to give everybody that comes to that an update. And I invite each of you to join us if you would like. Um, you can give me a call at um, the Step Up office, and I'll be happy to get you registered and, and have a place for you. Um, we will also learn about a more recent participant who has gone through our program and what it has meant to him. But um, Leroy is thriving. He has been reconnected with his family and his children. He has stable employment and has had stable employment for the last two years. And he's a great inspiration for all of us. Um, it's amazing to know um, what a simple program like this can do. And it was alien to me because I was raised in a world of double privilege. And I knew all along that I was going to graduate from high school, go to college, get a job, and you know, that's the things they would do. But that's not the reality for most people. And so this program helps that become a type of reality for them. And so that's why I'm very proud to be associated with it. Um, I'm sure y'all may have some questions. This is basically the end of what I was going to present for you all. We, um, we are, again, grateful for the church to be able to be housed here. It makes us a real presence. Having this room is really great for training, because as you can see, we can set it up in lots of different ways. Um, we provide meals during the week of training. You saw the experience with the clothing closet. We welcome you to volunteer if you are interested. Some of the things that we need help with most is in the clothing closet, helping people find an outfit. Or um, one of the things that we do during that week of training is we do a lot of practice interviewing. So if any of you have ever had the experience of having to hire someone, um, Coming and helping us interview those folks in a pretend kind of a way is really great. Um, I feel like I'm pretty adept at it because I used to manage a, 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 a distribution warehouse. And so for some of the gentlemen that are interested in warehouse work, I can really interview them. I know how to ask them questions about forklifts, and pickers, and pallet jacks, and things like that. Um, so if you have any experience in, in hiring somebody, be available for an hour or two. Um, you know, during a day of one week a month to do that, we would really appreciate that. And of course, like any nonprofit, we always need money. So if any of you are so compelled to write a check, we are welcoming all the nation. Thank you very much. Uh, question I'm sure you have. One. Yeah. Uh, how do you handle transportation? Because you folks here and back. That's a great question. One of the things that is part of our program is. We're fortunate that we're on a bus line here. So folks that are 
can get access to a bus, can get here. The, the bus stop is just right up here on the corner by the Shetler building. Um, but transportation is a big issue. And one of the things that we talk about during their week of training is, you know, for them to be able to be successful, they have to have reliable transportation. And if they are, if they don't have a driver's license, part of our plan is, will they be getting a driver's license? Will they be able to obtain transportation? One of our partner um, programs is a program called Wheels for Hope where once you've completed our program and you've gotten stable employment, you can apply with Wheels of Hope to get a vehicle. And I think the charge for that is around $700 to be able to get a used vehicle. So we do allow for transportation opportunities. That's important. Yes. John, thank you for a great program and presentation. You mentioned on the contributors the, uh, segment, uh, faith community. Yes. Can you expand that a little bit or what is it? So in the beginning, one of the things that Sharon did that would be really important is that other faith communities would buy into this program. So just like with Hot Dish and Hope, where other churches come here and serve the meals, it's not the full responsibility of First Presbyterian Church. She expanded on that model as well. And so we have financial support from other churches as a part of our funding model. Yeah. Yeah. I would think you'd be overwhelmed with applicants. So to hear eight or nine is a little surprising. How big is the market and how how little is it underserved in the principal So that's thank you, Glenn. That is a great question. <clears throat> in the beginning, as you might imagine, our classes would have 20 to 25 people in them. In our current job market, because of COVID, where anybody who can sign their name to an application could get a job anywhere, our numbers have dwindled. And so that is a real challenge for us. Um, employment is very easy right now, but we're not about those kinds of jobs. You know, we, we are about preparing folks to get a job that is more of a career than just a job. We don't want folks out there earning $10 an hour. We want to get them those warehouse jobs making 18 or $22 an hour. We want to prepare them for a real stable job that can allow them to create a, a life for their families and for themselves. And so <clears throat> one of our challenges is, of course, enrollment. And through our partnerships with the Salvation Army and Urban Ministries, we are increasing our numbers. Part of what they have done is they have contracted with us to provide pay. They pay us to provide the training to some of their participants, people living in their shelters or people that are coming through their programs, they realize that they're not really equipped. I mean, there are other jobs training programs out there. There are probably a couple hours on any given day where they might help you write a resume and tell you what you should look like. You know, when you go to an interview, our program is much more intensive than that. And it's and so we're grateful for those partnerships and we're continuing to expand those so that we can make sure that we're reaching the individuals who need our training. Well, I think we're coming up on real quickly. Yes. If yes. you want to donate clothes. Yes. Okay. If you, and when. So if you have clothing that you would wish to donate, we are here every single day, Monday through Friday from 8.30 to about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. You can just bring it right next door um, to the entrance to what was the old first school. And we'll get it to our clothing closet. Um, and we will obviously give you a donation form for that if you want to do that. And yes, we're always open to any type, especially clothing that is interview appropriate. Um, we don't really do anything with casual clothing because we're a jobs training program. So we like suits and dresses and you know, things that individuals would use to go on an interview. And one of the things that we try to stress is even though you may have taken a suit or a sport coat and you've been khakis, um, if you're interviewing for a warehouse job, you may not necessarily have to wear a jacket or a tie, but you do need a collared shirt, you do need khakis or dress pants, you know, we, we try to build the confidence in the appropriate type of attire that you would be wearing to a particular interview. Was there another question back here? Just quickly on I used to donate to that. I make out of the First Presbyterian Church and then step up there to the same way now. Or is it another? You could do that, or you could just make a check out to Step Up Ministries. We are our own independent 501c3 organization. 
Um, so you would get your, your charitable deduction either to the church or to us, either way. That'll just come to the back. Um, an address to send there, there is an address on the phone for that. Yes, thank you very much. Well, I think we're coming up on the end of our time, and I don't want to make us late for church. You don't want to give us a great sermon. <laughs> So thank you all for your kind attention and I appreciate the opportunity to come see us anytime. We're here. We, we love it when we have visitors, so appreciate it. Thank you so much, John. Are your offices located on this floor? Yes, we just right through that corridor. It is very impressive. If you want to ride the elevator, you have to go to the through the offices. But if you haven't been over there, go in and see just the walls. Right, they're beautiful with uh, pictures and uh, uh, all sorts of other things. And if that's uh, the way to start an impression, it certainly is because since you only have one chance to make a first impression, that made a first impression on me. And it's just great to go, go through there. Uh, next week's speaker is the ever sought after Sandy Rabbit. She'll be with us, uh, I, uh, I believe, uh, for the next two months, uh, October and November. The uh, uh, Jill's message is Philadelphia. She's in the pulpit today. If you'll stand, we'll have a closing prayer. If I can find it. Great, gracious Lord, may your, may your spirit give strength to all of your people as they work and witness in your world. Unite us in your truth and love and help us to know your love for others.